Well, hello there, 8th grade. Let's start our uh, test 6.5 study guide. So we're dividing two fractions here. And the way we divide two fractions is we multiply by the reciprocal of the second fraction. So in other words, we keep the first one the same, we make this into multiplication, and then we flip this one upside down. And whenever you guys are dealing with any type of negatives, just always just keep it on top. Okay? If there's only one, it goes on top. If there's two, then it becomes positive. But if there's only one, it goes on top. And then the way we multiply fractions, now that it's multiplication, we do our factor trees and cross out our ones. So you see that 4 is 2 times 2. Those are prime factors. And uh, 10 is 2 times 5. Notice that I put the negative out to the side here. Just crossed out my ones, which means there's a 2 on the top and 2 on the bottom. So I get to cross it out. And whatever's left over is my simplified answer. Now, if you don't see that answer, which is an okay answer, negative 15 over 2 is an okay answer. If you don't see that, you could convert it. Remember, we divide in and out. The remainder goes top, divisor goes as a numerator, excuse me, denominator, and that's how you convert. Problem two, we're adding two fractions. You got to look at the bottom number or the denominators. If they're not the same, if you don't have a common denominator, you need to take those two, look at their multiples, right? Two times one, two times two, two times three, two times four. Those are the multiples of two, and it keeps going infinitely. Look at the multiples of three, and the first time they're the same is six. They'll be the same again and again and again. The first time they're the same is called the lowest common denominator. So we're going to rewrite these two fractions. We're going to rewrite one half so that it's still the same as one half, but we want it to be a six in the bottom. And the way we can make it a six in the bottom is you say two times three is six. But if you want it to be the same fraction, you've got to multiply it to the top and the bottom because one half is the same exact number as three over six. Isn't three the same as half of six? Right? It's the same fraction. It just looks different. Same thing over here, we want a 6 on the bottom here, because remember, we got it from our LCD up here. And so we ask, what do I multiply 3 by to get 6? You multiply 2, but you got to do it to the top and the bottom, because the fraction 1 third is the exact same as 2 sixths, they're the same fraction. Now we can add them together now that we have common denominator, which is how big the pieces are. So we don't add those, we just carry it over, but we do add the numerators, we add the top. And... Make sure, check, see, do your factor trees, cross out your ones, make sure it's simplified and you're done. The way we're going to simplify number three is take a look at rad 64, which is a perfect square. 8 times 8 is 64. Rad 16 is a perfect square. 4 times 4 is 16. So rad 64 plus rad 16 is the same as 8 plus 4, which is simply 12. Problem number four, we're going to write this as a fraction. Anytime you have a fraction, you just divide. This goes in and this goes out. It goes in and out. Put your decimal on top, and you see that 1 half is the same as 0.5. Problem number 5. They give us a square. They tell us that we have a square, so I drew a square. And then the area inside, all the little squares to fill the inside there, is 79 units. So they want us to find the length of one of the sides. So whatever it is, this right here, we don't know. We can call it X or Y or whatever you want. If it's a square, this is the exact, exact same thing. So the way we find area of any type of box is this times this, or an x times x is just x squared. So x squared uh, equals 79. It's all good. x squared equals 79 is the equation that we're going to solve. We're going to figure out what x squared is. So we take the square root of both sides. And we know that 79 is not a perfect square. So what we do then is we start to narrow it down, right? We just start with 10 times 10. That's too big. And then we try something small. 8 times 8, 64 is too small. 9 times 9 is 81. So I know it's in between 64 and 81. That looks like this. So you have rad 64 is in between rad 79 and rad 81. So that means that the square root of, 70, uh, square root of 79 is in between the numbers 8 and 9. Right? Because the square root of 64 is 8 and the square root of 81 is 9. Okay. Notice that I didn't say the square root of 81 is the square root of 9. That's not true. It's just 9, not rad 9. So if it's in between 8 and 9, which of these numbers are in between 8 and 9? The only one that is is D. Now we can go further and, and get it closer, but if you know it's in between 8 and 9 and only one of your answers is in between 8 and 9, you know what your answer is. You can stop right there, couldn't you? Similar to the last problem, but instead of x squared, it's x cubed. So instead of asking ourselves what times itself equals that in there, we're saying what times itself and then times itself again. That's what the little 3 means above the x. That's what x cubed means. And these right here, they're all going to be perfect cubes. In other words, it's going to be some number. And since we're multiplying something 1, 2, 3 times, it's going to get huge really fast. So, in other words, your answers are going to be single digits for these in my, on my tests. So, but you got to think, because 
negative times another negative times another negative is a negative number, right? There's an odd number, one, two, three, that's an odd number. Being multiplied together, your answer is going to be negative. If there was an even number, it'd be positive. So it's going to be negative something, right? So we just start to narrow it down. Let's just start in the middle. 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. 8 times 8 times 8 is still too small. 9 times 9 times 9 is it. But remember, it has to be negative. So because negative times negative times another negative gives us a negative answer. Problem number 7, we're going to uh, give... Uh, Actually, we have to check to see which of these numbers are irrational because we have to decide which of these statements down here is true. And these statements are all about whether it's irrational or not. So looking at um, the numbers that they gave us, there's a square root, but the number inside is a perfect square. So that's rational. Again, if there's any fractions, it doesn't matter as long as you don't have an irrational part of the fraction. So the square root of 4, that's a perfect square. The square root of 4 is 2. So this number is the same as 2 thirds. So that's rational. Rational, ratio, ratio means fraction pretty much, right? Also, when you have a decimal, if it ends like this one or if it repeats like this one, those are always rational, right? There's a fraction that these will always equal, right? This will equal 125 over 1,000, which can be reduced, of course. Um, but if it's a pattern like this, where you see the dot, 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 and it goes on forever, right? That's different than this one going on forever because this one's going to repeat the same thing. This one doesn't repeat the same thing. It's always changing. So if it's never ending and always changing, that's irrational. Otherwise, all decimals are rational. So this time, they're all rational. So you need to, you want to review the rules for rational and irrational, right? Over here, again, a fraction is just rational. And every number that we study in eighth grade is a real number, so make sure your answer will always have real for this problem on the test. But just reviewing this real quick, right? Real numbers is everything you study. Rational is it can be written as a fraction, right? It can be a decimal, it can be a repeating decimal, it could have a square root as long as it's a perfect square in there, it can be a negative number, a regular old number, it can be two, something like that. Irrational are the weird ones where there's a square root and it's not a perfect square, are those decimals that are constantly changing, never ending, or pi. Those are the only irrationals you need to worry about, everything else is rational. So this number is rational and real. We simplify this, negative 3 to the second power. The negative second power means flip it. And then it becomes a positive, too. Notice that didn't inflict that negative, did it? Now that we have a positive exponent, now we can do the problem. We have negative 3 times itself 1, 2 times, and that's 1 over 9. For 10, we'll just go ahead and copy the base and add all the exponents because that's the shortcut. This is how, this is how we... Uh, multiply powers with the same base. And of course, when you're adding and there's any negatives involved, you can use teams. Okay? There was more negatives and positives over here, and that's why it's negative. Now, this is not simplified. You'd have to simplify it to 1 over 4, but they use those directions up here, rewrite. So that's why we didn't have to um, keep going. We could have stopped, and our answer has to be 4 to the negative first power. For this problem here, when we're dividing powers with the same base and, and when it's written like a fraction, it's division. In other words, you see the same big number, right, same base, then what you do is you just copy the base this time. Instead of adding the exponents, you subtract them. And since I said simplify instead of rewrite, we don't get a stop right here. We have to do 3 times 3 times another 3, and the answer is 27. We're going to evaluate this. a to the negative second, well, that's a equals 3, so that's 3 to the negative second power. b to the 0 power, well, b is negative 3. But isn't anything to the zero power just equal to one? So, all right, so I can just cross that out no matter what. I didn't need to mess with that. So I have one to the negative, uh, excuse me, three to the negative second power. Negative second power means flip it. Now it's a positive exponent. Now you can simplify it. One ninth is the answer. For this problem here, d to the fourth to the fourth power. When you have a power right next to another power, that's when you multiply the exponents. And when we have this, when we have a mix of product of power and quotient of power. In other words, when we're multiplying powers and we are also dividing powers, right, then just do it this way. I want you to simplify the top first. In other words, do all your multiplication and the way we multiply is by copying the base and adding the exponents. So I add 1 plus 3 plus negative 2. Use teams, you get positive 2. And now I'll do top and bottom. So make, pay attention to the order I told you to do it, right? This is the easiest way to do it. Just simplify the tops first, then do top and bottom, which is where we subtract the exponents. So, um, so now we have a negative exponent, 
And then we're going to go ahead and flip that upside down. And that's a simplified answer. Problem number 15. Okay, so problem number 15, we have this number right here. We have a very large number right here. We're going to write that in scientific notation. Well, scientific notation means wherever the decimal is, you're going to have to move it all the way to the right of the first number that's not zero. How many times do we move it? 11 times, okay? And it's a positive 11 because this is a really big number, as opposed to this would be a really small number, right? My five was over here. This would be a really big number, really small number, really small numbers, negative exponents, big numbers, positive exponents. Over here, now we're going to go back the other way, but I see it's negative exponent, okay? So it says write this uh, in, uh, excuse me, standard form. So what I'll do is I'll take my coefficient, and again, I'm just moving the decimal, but I'm going to move it six times this time, and since it's a negative exponent, that means it's actually a small number, so I won't move my decimals this way and make it bigger. Instead, I'll move my decimals this way one time. I have to add a zero, two, add another zero, three, four, five, six, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, so my decimal's here, so it looks like I have one, two, three, four, five zeros in front of 304. Remember, the decimal's not here anymore. It's all the way over here. That's why the answer is D and not C, okay? So taking a look at number 17, problem 17 over here. For problem 17, we're gonna, uh, which statement is true below given the two numbers? Well, I'm looking at this one, I'm looking at this one. I know this is a really small number and this is a really big number, so that's a pretty easy problem, right? Now let's say they were both really big numbers, and what I would do is I, would, I could write this one in scientific notation and then just compare the tens. Whichever one has a bigger exponent is bigger. Let's say they had the same exponent. Let's say had, let's say had a number like this, 10 times, uh, excuse me, let's say a little more complicated, 2.8 times 10 to the 6, and 3.1 times 10 to the 6. If I put them both in scientific notation and then I compare and they're the same, then I just look at the coefficient. Whatever coefficient is bigger is a bigger number. Okay? But let's say um, this had a 7. Then believe it or not, this one's way bigger than this one because this every one of these is 10 times bigger than these. Okay? So how do you know when something's bigger? Look at the exponent, the, the power of 10. And if they're the same, look at the coefficients, look at the front number. Now, if you have an easy problem like this, this problem is a lot easier because I know this is a small number and I know this is a big number, so obviously um, A is smaller than B for this one, number 17. Okay, looking at 18 now. I'm going to rewrite the number in scientific notation. So this is not in scientific notation. It looks like it is. But this right here doesn't have the decimal in the right spot. So I'm just going to take this part and write it in scientific notation. So 45 is the same as 4.5 times 10. 10 is 10 to the first, correct? How do I know that? Because I had to move the decimal one time to put it in scientific notation. So we can't forget that. We can't forget that this equals these two. Now the other thing you can't forget when you're doing this problem also is don't forget this is part of the problem too. That 10 to the fifth didn't go away. So what I do next is what we learn when multiplying powers with the same base. I just copy the base and add the exponent. But now my answer is in scientific notation. So we are, here we have a problem where they start talking about uh, feet per second, that's a rate. They start talking about seconds, that's a time. And they say how far, that's distance. Anytime you have any type of distance problem, you always use the distance formula. Distance formula is distance is found by multiplying how fast you're going times how long you went that fast. In other words, you really have to memorize this for every math class you take. Distance equals rate times time. You just, you just need to memorize that, okay? So distance equals rate times time. So we ask ourselves, what do they give us? In this case, they gave us a rate. Anytime they use per or each or every, that's a rate. So they gave us the R. And then they gave us seconds. That seconds is obviously time. So distance equals rate times time. They asked us how far. In other words, we don't know distance. So how do I get distance? I do rate times time. Now, how do I multiply uh, rate times time when they're both the scientific notation? Well, just multiply the two coefficients together. I'll show you the work down here. Do it on your own, though, without a calculator. Here's the work down here. And then, of course, multiplying powers of 10, just copy the base and add the exponents. And if this part right here wasn't in scientific notation, again, you do what we did in that last problem where you put that part in scientific notation and then add your two tens to get your answer. Now, because they said about, usually when they say about, we get around. But uh, when they say about to this problem here, we just get around the coefficient. So that's about 8.7. That's why the answer is C for this one. So, same type of problem here, only this time they gave us the distance and the rate and we had to find time. So if they gave us the distance and the rate and we have to find time, 
you want to know what time equals, you can isolate time by dividing both sides by the rate. Similar to the last problem, only instead of multiplying our two coefficients, we're dividing them. Just make sure you put the right one in and the right one out. How do I know what goes in? Just remember this, distance is always on top. Distance is always on top when you have to divide for these problems, okay? Why is it on top? Because if I have distance equals rate times time, and I need to know, and I had rate or time, it doesn't matter, if I needed to know the other one, I can isolate it by dividing distance by whatever the other one is. So just remember, distance on top, it goes this divided by this, not the other way around. Top one goes in, bottom one goes out. We get our number there, and then when we divide, uh, these two cross out. When we divide our tens, remember what we said earlier, we copy the base, subtract the exponent, 8 minus 8 is 0. Now, if I'm going to convert this number down here to standard notation, I'm going to move my decimal right here this many times. Moving it 0 times just means the answer is 0.45, or in other words, the answer is A for this one. And that's it for our study guide. Hope that helped you guys out. We will see you guys soon.